loud. Okay, great. So welcome everyone to our um, MTSS webinar. Um, so excited to have my two wonderful colleagues, Katie Putoff and Michelle Frey, join me from Holy Family School. Um, before we get started, I have a couple little kind of businessy housekeeping kinds of things about the center. So I am Dr. Amy Murdoch from Mount St. Joseph University, and I am a faculty member in our reading science program and the director of that program, as well as the director of our Center for Reading Science. So I have a couple little announcements to make, and then we will get right into the webinar. So first of all, I want to invite everyone to become a member of the Center for Reading Science, if you haven't already. Um, as a member, you will have access to a few member-only webinars throughout the year. Um, we also are planning a members-only book study. We have a quarterly newspaper or newsletter that we will send out to our members. Um, you also will have access to the center resources. And even if you're not in Cincinnati, you can have access to our resources through the Mount St. Joseph Library, including um, database searches, which is a wonderful plus. Um, and then also members will get priority registration for our MSJ Reading Science Summit that will happen in the summer on June 20 this year. Uh, so membership is $50 annually. There's a little QR code here if you want to do that to uh, register for membership, or you can visit our website, readingscience.org. And our first member-only webinar will be a follow-up to this session on October 17th, where we'll talk more about MTSS and answer implementation questions and talk more about some of our tools that we're going to share as part of this uh, webinar today. So if you're interested, please sign up. A couple other quick little announcements. If you are going to the Reading League Conference in Syracuse, we are doing an information session about the MSJ uh, graduate and doctoral programs um, on Tuesday, October 3rd. And again, you can register for that event on our uh, readingscience.org website. Um, and finally, my last announcement is a little call out for participants in one of our doctoral students' um, dissertation studies about sound spelling walls. If you have a sound spelling wall and you work with children kindergarten through second grade, you can be a classroom teacher, a reading specialist, an interventionist. Um, if you have a sound spelling wall and you're interested in participating, um, please email Tamara and she can send you the link for, um, for participation and you get free web webinar, free web-based resources, as well as Tamara is going to do a webinar, which is like an advanced sound wall training. And she's, she's wonderful. So if you're interested, please check that out. All right. So we're going to get started on our webinar for this evening. Um, we are going to talk about the multi-tiered system of support and successfully building tiers one through three. Um, and I'm going to let my colleagues introduce themselves. As I said, I'm uh, Amy Murdoch, and I've had the pleasure of being a consultant at Holy Family School and working with the staff there to implement MTSS in preschool through third grade. So, Katie, do you want to introduce yourself? And also, you can introduce the school. Sure. Uh, I'm Katie Putoff. I am the principal at Holy Family School. Um, Holy Family is a preschool through eighth grade elementary school in East Price Hill um, in the inner city of Cincinnati. And um, this is my sixth year as principal there. I taught for nine years prior to um, be coming to Holy Family at another school. And I actually taught middle school during, during that time there. Um, Holy Family, we have 235 students, one class of each grade, kindergarten through eighth grade, and then we have two preschool classes. 96% um, of our families are living in poverty. We have a high uh, English language learner population as well. So um, about 82% of our students have English as their second language. Um, so that's just a little bit about our demographics and um, our school. I think we lost Michelle. Oh, there she is. I'm going to, I think she had trouble. Um, so let me put her back as a panelist. I think, I think she was having a little trouble um, earlier with, with Zoom. So hopefully she's joined us again. Michelle, are you there? Oh, she's back. Okay, good. <laughs> oh, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 
There I am. Hi. <laughs> Hi, my name is Michelle Fry. I have been teaching in the Archdiocese of Cincinnati for 26 years. Most of those 26 years have been in the urban, urban core um, of Cincinnati. I um, spent 10 years of those 26 years as an intervention specialist and 16 years as a classroom teacher. I am very excited. This year, my role is different. I am at my same school at Holy Family, but I am a reading specialist there. I just finished the reading endorsement and the reading science program at Mount St. Joe. And now I'm trying my new skills out, working with students kindergarten through grade five. Thank you. Um, so our objective, we really have one objective for this evening, and that, that is to show an example of how MTSS can be implemented in kindergarten through third grade. Um, we also did implement MTSS in preschool, but for the purpose of this webinar, we are going to focus on our K-3 implementation. So um, I'm going to start with some data because this project, we are beginning year four of our work together. And one thing that I think you'll hear across the presentation is um, it takes some time. But you know, with, with the right will and the right people, you can you can get there and have beautiful, um, beautiful data. <laughs> um, but it definitely takes some time. So this is our kindergarten reading composite score. Um, we began our work at Holy Family in the middle of the year 2020, 2021. And really that first year was mainly a planning year. We did implement some things as I'll talk about, but mainly it was a planning year. So the, so the green um, box plots are kind of, you can think of as baseline. So many of you I know on this call are familiar with these kinds of graphs, but this is the middle of the year benchmark of all of the kids in kindergarten. Um, this is the, the 25th percentile, the 75th percentile, and then the line in the middle is the 50th percentile, and then the more extreme scores. So you can see there was quite a range of kindergartners that first year. Um, the green line here represents the goal that we want all kids to get to. The yellow is kind of some risk, and the red is um, higher risk. So the blue represents our first kind of full year of implementation. And then the purple represents this past year where really in kindergarten, we had full implementation of tier one through two and kind of almost a little bit of tier three in kindergarten. So we'll talk about that, but I always like to start with data to show you nice steady progress um, that we saw. Other thing that I'll welcome you to do is to, um, any questions you have, please put them in the, the chat. There's a Q or in the Q and A. Um, Larissa Phillips has just joined us. She's our assistant director of the Center for Reading Science. She's also part of our Holy Family team who's worked on MTSS implementation. So we'll invite her to chime in as well, but she has offered to monitor the, the Q and A and help bring, bring questions to our attention as they come up. Um, so, I want to turn it over to Katie and Michelle and talk about kind of key takeaways for you to kind of listen into as we talk through our implementation efforts. So I think um, the biggest thing to pay attention to as we kind of talk about how our school went through this is, first of all, I don't think it's a one size fits all approach. I think there are many um, ways to do it right. And so for us, um, when we started, you know, we knew that our students were struggling and we wanted to find a way to help them improve. Um, and so for us, it was about um, getting everybody in the building on board, building systems that allowed everybody to um, teach in the way that they needed to teach and allowed our students to get the support they needed, no matter what their level, um, where, where they were. And so I think that's important. And then patience and time. And we started small. We picked one big thing to start with and we started there and then we went from there. So I think that would be as far as from the administrator perspective, getting um, staff buy-in at the school level, creating those systems and then plugging away one thing at a time. And I think um, my key takeaway as a classroom teacher is that with hard work, you can you can make huge changes. I I feel like through um, our partnership with the Mount, our students who were so deserving to become readers are now 
um, growing in their reading and it can be done if we can do it any school can do it if um, you know it takes it takes hard work but where there's a will there's a way I did want to add, Amy, to the, the data that you were talking about when you were referring to the kindergarten data. Um, I did. I was taking a look a little bit at our data where we came from before this, and I took a look at the current fourth graders who, who just graduated from third grade last year, and they had really two and a half years of the program still from when we started. So they didn't even have two and a half full years of implementation, but they've been in the program the longest with us. In their class, if I look at that same group of kids um, in kindergarten, the middle of year kindergarten for them, which is when we started this, they we only had 29% of that class on benchmark. And when they left third grade at the end of the year last year, we had 81% of those kids on benchmark. And so for me, that was the biggest thing, just looking at, you know, it, it always seemed like, oh, the kid who str struggles in reading always struggles in reading. But once we started teaching this way, it was like that doesn't have to happen. You know, we we really were able to close the gap, which I think, you know, anybody on this this webinar that is in education knows that that's a tall task. And once we started um, doing this and having the coordinated MTSS process along with the science of reading instructional techniques, um, we were really able to start closing gaps. Yeah, Katie, I love that you shared that because I think the other takeaway with that is sometimes it's not in one year that you close the gap for every children. Some children, we do need a little bit more time. So I think that's one thing that we've learned too. It's kind of like a long game, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're understanding each year who's who needs the support and keeping tabs on the kids who didn't make it to the benchmark, grade level benchmark that we wanted them to, making sure that we see good progress, but knowing for some kids, if they're significantly behind, we might need a year and a half or even two years, especially with English learners um, who are also brand new to learning um, English in school. And I should say, um, Holy Family is not a bilingual program. They have a high number of English learners, but it is an, an English um, reading program. So yeah, great. So this project is part of a larger project that Mount St. Joseph University has partnered with the Ohio Department of Education, as well as the University of Cincinnati School Psychology Program um, called Partners. And Partners is a OSEP, um, so the Office of Special Education Programs grant, and it's a model demonstration grant for early identification and support of children with dyslexia. Um, so we have other partners that are listed on this screen that I wanted to give um, a shout out to. Uh, we have great partners at the Ohio Department of Education that have also connected with Holy Family. Um, there's three main consultants, myself, Carolyn Turner, who works with another one of our partner schools, and then Dr. Wendy Strickler, who also works with another. So we have three partner schools. Holy Family is the one that I mainly support, but really it's a team effort and we've all been involved in this work. Um, in our model demonstration, we've focused on implementing um, an MTSS system to understand those at risk for reading concerns and to understand um, reading disabilities such as dyslexia. So our goal was to help a school or our three schools fully put into place a MTSS system that can support all kids. And then once we support all kids, we can understand better children who have dyslexia and other um, more significant reading concerns. So the key components of our partners grant at our three sites, including Holy Family, is to fully implement MTSS. We also are working to build a statewide system to help schools across Ohio implement MTSS in the science of reading. So the work that we've been doing, we are now training other um, literacy specialists across the state, which is really exciting. And Holy Family has had lots of visitors, um, including the state superintendent, to see how they have been doing things um, in terms of putting these practices into place in a real school, um, serving children who have, you know, a lot of challenges in terms of poverty and learning a second language. Another goal is to create easy to use tools that support the work. And that's some of the some of the things that we're going to share with you um, this evening. So the Partners Project is across four years um, and really Holy Family, we had a staggered implementation. So we started with one school, 
Holy Family joined us the second year. And as I said, we're going into the fourth year of the project, but the third year with, with Holy Family. And our focus across all three of our sites is we really wanted to focus in on um, how to support schools that were serving low-income students, um, how to make sure that all kids have access to high-quality instruction. Um, so Katie, do you want to talk about your team at Holy Family and how we sure. got started? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so at Holy Family, we are lucky to have um, a lot of different team players on our team. Um, so I'm the principal, and then we have um, two pre lead preschool teachers, and each preschool class has an assistant teacher as well. Then we have um, one teacher um, in each of the grades, kindergarten through third grade. We have one ELL teacher that supports kindergarten through third grade. We also have an additional ESL teacher that supports fourth through eighth grade. But for this project, um, there was one, one ELL teacher. We have one, um, one intervention specialist, and then we have one um, reading interventionist, which is Michelle's current position this year. And then we also have a Title I reading teacher as well. So uh, both of those people are able to support our um, homeroom teachers that, that teach in the gen ed classroom. Great. When we first started working with Holy Family, um, I'll just take everybody back, although we might not want to go back there to 2021, <laughs> which was all of us dealing with kind of the height of pandemic restrictions. Um, and Holy Family across our project um, did have to deal with all of the all of the things all of our schools have had to deal with in terms of the pandemic. So I think that's an important context to keep in mind. And I think that really speaks to the work of this school even more so because despite pandemic um, restrictions and attendance issues and all, all of the things, um, they still were able to make amazing growth with their students. But when we began in the spring of 2021, um, at that time, science of reading was new to Holy Family. Correct me if I'm wrong, Katie and Michelle, mm -hmm. uh, but this was something that was new. Um, mm -hmm. They didn't have a universal screener in place at their school that, that was useful. <laughs> they, they had one that was not as useful, which now they do not have. Um, so we really <laughs> began, we, we have a process that I'll talk with you about in a second, a collaborative problem solving process at the systems level. But even before doing that, we realized we really needed to put into place a universal screener so that we could have some good data about where the students were. And then we also really needed to put into place some supports around teacher training. And so um, the staff, including the principal and all of the people listed under the team went through letters training. And I think that is key because it was a team effort and everybody going through a similar training was, was super important. So we began that right away before we got into um, problem solving about specific work. Um, and Carolyn Turner was our letters trainer and she's just wonderful. Um, so year one, as I said, was a planning year. So we put right away, we put Acadian's um, universal screening in place and we ca ca captured that winter benchmark so that we could look at the data and start understanding where the needs of our students were. So step one, even before that was getting buy-in and Katie was really smart as a principal um, to set it up really nicely. So she invited our team in, we talked with the staff about the project and about kind of why this was important. And we were able to have some nice discussions about this being an initiative to undertake. Um, and then, yeah, I, go ahead, Katie. I yeah. just wanted to say, I think it's really important that, um, you know, when when deciding to sort of jump in with this, um, my main reasoning for doing that was my teachers were coming to me and, and saying like, these kids are working so hard. I saw the teachers working so hard. Everybody was putting every ounce of blood, sweat and tears that they knew how to into our students and our students were trying hard, their, their families were very supportive and we just weren't seeing the results. We were still seeing kids struggling to learn to read. And so when my, my teachers were saying like, gosh, like, what can we do? What can we do? Like these kids deserve to read. Um, how can we help that? That's when I knew, okay, we need to figure something out. 
Um, and so when we were approached about this project, I knew that we needed to learn what, what is the best way to teach students how to read and how, how can we do things so that we get the most bang for our buck. So the, like Amy said, when we were going through letters training, it was like that aha moment for all of our staff, every single um, unit that we would study. We were like, oh my gosh, you know, learning this research was just, I think, really eye-opening to all of our, every single member of our staff. Um, and it was just something that, you know, even with the best teachers, we have teachers of all levels of education that we just didn't know. We didn't get that. And I think that is happening across the nation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And yes, um, I was thinking that first year, we had a, a first year, first grade teacher, and then we had very seasoned um, third grade teacher. And it was so powerful to have everybody going through this training together and having those discussions together. Um, so, so after they got a couple modules of letters down, um, we began using a collaborative problem solving process. And we really focused on building tier one and tier two at the same time for one area, which we decided to focus on word recognition to start. Um, so the tool that we use to guide us through um, a collaborative problem solving process is a tool that in Ohio, uh, I have worked with for a while. Um, originally, a colleague and I developed it, uh, Tanya Ilo in 2006 um, for some state work in Ohio. And as part of this grant, we kind of dusted it off and, and revised it and um, began using it with our three partner schools. And this tool, it's called the Literacy Analysis and Planning Guide, the LAPG, really walks schools through co collaborative problem solving to build an MTSS system. So that's my role as a consultant was to guide them through this as we look at it. And we look at each tier, we look at professional learning, the assessment system, instructional materials and delivery, implementation, and family connections. So those were the areas in which we were problem solving, analyzing what we have in place, and then making plans to put in place more powerful um, things in all of these areas. So as I said, we decided as a team to do both tier one and tier two at the same time. Um, and we started, as I kind of already said, we started with professional development, even really before we got into the LAPG too far, because you can't really do the LAPG unless you have some knowledge. So knowledgeable teachers engaging in analysis and planning work is crucial. So we really began letters in the Acadians assessment system first, and then a couple months later in the spring, we started our work around analyzing the system. The LAPG was an absolute game changer for us. It's how we really were able to look at our program without rose colored glasses and decide, are we actually doing these best practices? Is our program doing this? Do we have this in place? Um, and we were only able to do that successfully because we had had the professional development prior to know what those practices should be. But I highly recommend um, doing something like that where you're able to analyze, truly analyze your program first before making decisions. Mm -hmm. And initially, so you start with, with the LEPG, you start with looking at your data. That's why we had to make sure we had some um, good data to look at. And, you know, we, we here's the percentage of kids by the different grade levels at that winter benchmark when we first began um, where kids were in terms of the percentage of kids at benchmark. And through going through letters, as, as Katie and Michelle mentioned, people really had their eyes opened in terms of what effective reading instruction could look like. And there's always a little bit of dissonance. I think that happens when teachers go through some training, especially teachers who are open and, and really passionate about their students, which every single teacher on this staff was. Um, sometimes you feel like you failed, right? Like you mm -hmm. feel like, oh my goodness, I've not been doing these things. Um, and that's a hard place to be. And we definitely had teachers like that. We had really fabulous teachers who felt you know, like they had failed their kids, you know. Um, we have a wonderful third grade teacher at the time who I remember came to Katie and I and said, maybe I shouldn't teach third grade. And she's wonderful, you know, and, and wait till you see her data in a second when I show you the, <laughs> the third grade data. It's just, she wasn't equipped with the right knowledge and, and tools. Um, and so that was an important kind of 
Thanks, Spot. Yeah, go ahead. I have one of the, the best teachers. She's really, she's one of the best teachers that I've ever seen. Um, but she was able to take a look and be like, gosh, I wish I had known this for all these kids that I've taught previously. Um, and I think that sentiment was shared amongst all of our teachers. And our, you know, I, we just kept saying, you know, when we know better, we do better. And so that's what we're going to do now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So this is just, again, a little graph that shows where we started. And 30% on the lap G means um, with the lap G, you kind of rate your different, in terms of analysis, you rate your different activities to say, hey, um, one, this is something we really need to focus and plan around. Two is this needs a little bit of work. And a three is we're in place. Um, so 30% is basically the lowest score you can get. So 30% means we we have many items in this area that we need to score. So you can see there was a lot of areas where we felt like we needed a kind of focus in. So that's K1, and then this is two, three. Um, so, so we had a lot of a lot of good work to do. Um, the other thing I will say about this staff is they were they were honest <laughs> in all, on all the grade levels. They would say, no, we need to work on this. And and screening was a bit higher because we started with screening. Um, but we had we had areas that we needed to work on. Um, so we started in the summer really focusing and remember they got Acadians training. They also got some, I think, I think the first year remind me how many units of letters did you guys do? Do you remember? Well, so it was two during the school year and then two during the summer for like say, June, yeah. August, four yeah. total. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because letters was across two years. Some of you on this call probably have done that as well. So they had some letters under their belt. Um, and over the summer, we did some intensive training. We kept doing letters, as they said, and then we also focused on MTSS and really database decision making. So how do we make decisions based on progress monitoring and screening, um, differentiated small group work? So really focused in on a lot of good work, thinking about how to use data to make decisions about instruction. We also, through the planning, decided in both K-1 and 2-3, to focus on word recognition skills. So the lab G looks at all components of reading, um, language comprehension and writing as well, but we felt as a team to prioritize word recognition first. As Katie said, we had to make some decisions about where to focus on first. And then as you'll see, we, we did eventually focus on all the areas, but we felt phonics word recognition skills were, were, the, were the place that had the most needs and also the place where we could see you know, some big impact, we could put these things in place. Um, and so we decided the if they couldn't decode the words, then it was going to be difficult for us to focus on the rest. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so as part of our work, we've reviewed um, the, the teachers with my help and some of the other consultants on our team, reviewed different core and supplemental programs for word recognition. Um, we also a lot of good work on the schedule. I think the schedule is one of the <laughs> biggest challenges, mm -hmm. um, which again, so key to have your principal on board. Um, and then we began kind of, we made some plans in the summer and then we began with fall implementation for tier one and tier two with um, changes in our word recognition. So kindergarten and first grade, they made the decision to keep their core program. They were using a program called Super Kids. And the phonics part of Super Kids is pretty good in K-1, um, but it's done in whole group. And we knew for our kids that that wasn't working because there wasn't differentiation. We had kids at different levels. Um, as Katie said, 82% of our population is English learners that really needed that more small group instructional experience, both for language as well as phonics skills. Um, and so what we did is we said, okay, we're going to take Super Kids core phonics and we're going to not make it into whole group. We're going to use it small group. And um, Wendy Carolyn and I created a script to make it more explicit and systematic. And we thought, okay, this, this might work. <laughs> it did not work. <laughs> so you'll, you'll hear, as a spoiler alert, we changed that um, after we kind tried. of a couple months. <laughs> we, tried. we tried. And and I'll tell you the reason it didn't work is is because it didn't have all the supporting materials. Um, it just didn't have enough words to practice or, or uh, passages it to read. It just wasn't explicit enough. It wasn't, it was. yeah, it really wasn't as explicit and systematic as we needed. Mm -hmm. And and in kindergarten, especially, th this teacher was used to doing whole group for 
the majority of the day. So doing small groups, she really needed instructional materials to support her instruction, as we all do, that were explicit and systematic and allowed her to differentiate. And what we what we tried didn't work at first, which is also a good lesson. Things don't always work at first and you, <laughs> you regroup, which is what we did. In second and third grade over the summer, we reviewed different core programs or different um, word recognition instructional programs. And we decided to adopt 95% group, the phonics lesson library. And we did the phonics lesson library for both tier one and tier two. Um, because we felt like that differentiation piece of phonics lesson library worked so well for second and third graders in tier one, because we could take those kids who were, you know, doing really well, and we could actually accelerate their growth. Um, and then those kids who needed more, we could give them what they needed. So we used uh, phonics lesson library. Go ahead, Katie. Yeah, I was just going to say, especially, you know, when we started, our kids were at such a wide range of abilities. You know, we had kids that were two grade levels behind or one grade level behind or a couple months behind or on level. Um, and so we, it really did allow us to meet their needs, meet them right where they were with the skills that they needed to be taught. Yeah, I was just thinking, cause we, we had a data meeting recently for this school year where we've been doing this for a couple of years now. And our kids were much closer in terms of where they should start. Uh, phonics Lesson Library has a phonics inventory that you do to help you know where to place students based on their skills in the program. And the range, like in this year in third grade, was like, you know, 9.1 to like 10.2 or something like that. Versus when we first started, the range in third grade was like 2.1 <laughs> to, you know. Very beginning of yeah. the phonics lesson library. Yeah. yeah. So um, having that consistency really <clears throat> does help you accelerate. <laughs> and those kids, those kids who were far behind, we did tier two with them. So they got a second scoop of the phonics lesson library. So they weren't just progressing at the same rate as, as those kids who were further along in the program. We accelerated their progress. And by the end of the year, they caught up with the kids who were um, getting one scoop each day. So that's the other key thing with tier two. Phonics Lesson Library so nicely allowed us to do that. Um, mm -hmm. So any structured, systematic literacy program really allows you to do that double dose or double scoop for kids who are behind and catch them up, which of course is the goal for intervention. Mm -hmm. um, so as I said, spoiler alert, it didn't really work in K-1, but Second and third grade was rocking phonics lesson library, and, and we were seeing amazing results. And it started in first grade with the first grade teacher kind of like peering into Michelle's door saying, hey, what, what, what are you guys doing? <laughs> and then she actually said, can I try that? So mm -hmm. we tried it in first grade, and it worked really well. Um, Michelle was teaching second grade at the time. Oh, sorry. It yes. was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Michelle was our fabulous second grade teacher, and um, Michelle supported the first grade teacher. To, and the first grade teacher was a first year first grade teacher too, and um, and so she began doing it. She she first began doing it just with her kind of um, lowest groups, but then quickly began doing it with all of her groups as well. Um, and then with the success, we helped kindergarten change as well. And in kindergarten, we did the core phonics program in kindergarten. But 95% has the core phonics set up as whole group. We knew that wasn't going to work for our students because they were at different levels. And again, because of the language needs, we really felt that small group would have the, the biggest bang for our buck. So we did the core phonics program in kindergarten, but we did it in small groups. And the reason we didn't do phonics lesson library for kindergarten is because it doesn't go down that low for kindergarten grade level. Um, so that the core did that for us and we were just able to adapt it to be small group. So I really wanna punctuate this because I think this, I think we all feel this, that that differentiated small group in tier one with meaningful group and center work was key. And as we'll show you in a second, we flooded tier one with adults. And so in kindergarten and in first, and actually kindergarten through third grade, we were very mindful that we didn't want kids in centers working alone um, mm -hmm. for too long. Some centers, great and wonderful, mm -hmm. but we really prioritized reading um, and really did a lot of work to look at our other adults in the, in the school and how we utilize those specialists and really focused in on a differentiated tier one time 
because we had a lot of kids we had to move in terms of their reading outcomes. Um, so kind of some key things, Katie or Michelle, do you want to do this slide? Some key things about kind of our effective small group differentiation. Sure. So coordinated coordination of support, everyone working together. I think that was huge. We stopped looking at it like these are my kids and those are her kids, you know, um, because, okay, these are our lowest students. They need extra support. So they, they go to Title I or they go to the reading specialist. Um, instead, we started really working together. I mean, to the point where they were carrying sheets of paper that said, I taught this lesson in the morning, so you're going to teach this lesson in the afternoon. It was so very coordinated um, as far as getting every kid to the, the skill that they need um, and the amount of instruction that they needed each day. So pulling everybody to work together was huge, I think. And Michelle, you can speak to that as a classroom teacher. Absolutely. I think this can't be done by just the classroom teacher. Sorry, I'm battling laryngitis. <laughs> um, but no, it is all hands on deck. I mean, based on like um, Katie and um, Dr. Murdoch talking about where they fell in the phonic screener, you know, to make those effective small groups, we did need the extra support people pitching in to meet the kids where they were. So that was just critical. Um, to teach them in the small group setting. Yeah, and then we we used our data to determine um, what the groups were going to be, meaning you know who should be in what group and mm -hmm. what skill those groups were going to work on or start begin on what they needed. Um, and then our groups were fluid. So as a student mastered that, if they showed, okay, I've mastered this skill, I'm ready to move on to the next group, we did. So um, I'm, I'm sure Amy will talk about this a little bit, but we did monthly progress monitoring meetings. We still do pro monthly progress monitoring meetings um, where we we chose to progress monitor all of our students who were below benchmark, every single one. And at the beginning, it was a lot <laughs> of students. Um, and so we we had we progress monitored them weekly. So we had data in every month. Then we came together, the full team came together to review every student's progress monitoring graph and make decisions on their grouping, their instruction, their timing based on that. So that was um, really important. Mm -hmm. And then strongest educators with the neediest students, you know, we made sure that our teachers who were getting the professional development who had the skills. Um, we're seeing those students. And, and like Amy said, we were lucky that, you know, we had a lot of staff um, going through professional development in, in different varying levels. Um, and so we made sure that the teachers that were doing that instruction had the skills that they needed to. Yeah, and I wanted to just piggyback on that, that um, as a classroom teacher, I saw all of my title students every single day in small group, you know, for that double scoop. It wasn't just these are the title students, as Katie said, they were our students. And so we were taking the time, you know, all the teachers were seeing the students that had the most needs every single day in small group, in addition to their title time. And that was a big shift for us to make that sure was. that, that the, the gen ed teacher was seeing those lowest kids every single day as well. Mm -hmm. And that I think paid off tremendously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the communication among teachers and specialists was so key. As Katie talked about, they, you know, they had little, we had kept little logs so we knew exactly mm -hmm. where kids were and they could communicate, okay, I did this lesson, but I think it needs to be repeat, repeated. Like, don't move on yet because we need to, we need to shore up these skills. And I think that's key too. So it wasn't just checking off, we're going through, but it was really having that small group time where you could see where kids were and what they were mastering. And who might, in, in our data meetings, we would talk about who might need to go up to a higher group, which group mm -hmm. might need to repeat some lessons. Um, like kids couldn't fall through a crack when you meet with them every, when the team meets every mm -hmm. month to really look at each child's progress and are they where they need to be and do, you know, we did some quick little problem solving for kids who weren't making growth that we could make small tweaks to their their plan which was and key. that was that was like a confidence boost too to have those meetings you know working as we all met together each month and then um the classroom teacher is the one that does the progress monitoring and so that I had really had my finger on all those kids that you know that that needed my support 
you know, on a weekly basis, and then having kind of the support of the whole team looking at the data, not just me trying to figure out what do I do next, you know, all the minds together. That was just that, amazing help. And I think it also helped that it wasn't one person. So when you were looking at data, you weren't like, oh my gosh, this is my fault that somebody didn't make the progress or that they did make the progress. It's not just me because right. the classroom teacher saw that kid and then the reading specialist or title one teacher also saw that kid. Um, and so that I think was also really beneficial. Mm -hmm. And I know some of you might be thinking like, gosh, you know, the teacher's progress monitoring, they're doing these double scoops, they're seeing they're on level kids, they're not on level kids. Um, and it is a lot, but we did really have to look at our time and how it was best spent. Uh, and one example of that is, you know, we stopped giving a weekly spelling test where we had kids go memorize a spelling list and, um, you know, taking a full Friday spelling, you know, Friday class to do that. Instead, we, um, we adapted our spelling so that we were asking them to apply the skills that they had been working on all week and not just memorizing things but that was one time shift. Um, and then we, we really sat down and looked at the schedule and said, okay, how, where are we gonna fit this in? How are we gonna fit this in? Where should our time be spent? Yeah, and it was a prioritizing tier one reading instruction and, and tier two. Um, Katie wouldn't let field trips happen <laughs> during reading instruction unless it just really, really had to. Um, you know, kids were not pulled for other things. Like it just became this protected time and all the adults flooded where they needed to be based on kids tier one reading instruction. And that was key. So we, we had some nice adult support because of our population. We had a fabulous, we still have the same fabulous ELL teacher, but she wasn't being utilized in maybe the most effective way previously. Um, with this new model, we utilize her in a different way to help work with small groups around language while the teacher's doing small group differentiated instruction. I um, wanted to show you, I was going to talk through this. This is, a, this is a real schedule from first grade a couple of years ago, and it looks different a little bit this year because times change. But just to give you an idea of what we mean by adults kind of flooded in, um, and the, the, the teacher, as Michelle said, the teacher saw all kids. So she saw her lowest students. She saw her on-level students. Um, so in this little example, the, the, CT, CT, right? yeah, the CT is the classroom teacher. Um, title is our title reading specialist, and then the RI is the reading interventionist, and then the ELL teacher. So we would have kind of homeroom time. Project Learn is our language comprehension writing component, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then reading small group time. So this was our key time. So the classroom teacher would do her two on-level groups in this situation, and these two groups were at slightly different levels, and so she would see two groups, but they're on level, so a little bit less time with them in a more, you know, accelerated manner. Um, while the title teacher took group three and the reading interventionist took group four. Um, these are like levels by, you know, well below and significantly well below in terms of their groupings, um, in terms of their skills. And so you can kind of see that the, the on level kids did have one cycle where they were in a um, center and we had classroom centers. We did a lot of work on classroom centers to make those meaningful. And so, but most of the time they were with an adult working with them. Then we had another project learn time. This is our time where we do content as well as writing instruction. We do teach math, so that's really important. Um, we get that question. Science and social studies, but within science, yes. <laughs> yes, and our science and social studies is part of project learn. That we that was one way that we really utilized our time differently as we pushed um, in comprehension work within science and social studies. And then we had a reading intervention time and enrichment time. And this is where um, the classroom teacher would work with her lower students, the kids who were not on level to get their second scoop, so their second um, phonics lesson. And the ELL teacher pushed in during this time to work on work work with the on-level students. And then they did have centers as well as part of that time. Um, and then they had specials and um, we're a Catholic school, so they do have religion and then end of the day. Just to give you an example of what it looks like in first grade and all the grade levels, slightly different configurations, but similar, similar look. Um, like in kindergarten, we know they couldn't work as independently as much. So um, we utilized 
a teaching assistant in kindergarten. And we have a wonderful volunteer, Sister Peg, who works with our students, um, that she did a small group language um, comprehension work. And then we do sometimes use technology. So we'll use computer. And then again, the teacher, that allows the teacher to do that small group differentiation. But all of the kids are doing meaningful, important literacy work as that teacher is meeting with a small group right on their level. So the end of year one, things that we had put in place, um, we put in place universal screening and progress monitoring. This is that, remember we had kind of a half year of planning and then a full year of implementation. Um, the K through staff had gone through letters, um, almost finished by this point. And then a lot of work on database decision-making tier one and two, small group differentiated instruction was happening very nicely at this point. And, and that, that was a learning curve for a lot of teachers who weren't mm -hmm. used to that. And so we did have to support teachers based on needs. Some teachers were ready to go, you give it to them, I'm ready, I got it, that's Michelle. <laughs> um, but we did have other teachers, this was new and they got there, but we did have to support them. So we differentiated our coaching support as well. Um, and then the coordination of those instructional supports, all the specialists and how we utilize them. So this is our LAPD in terms of the things that were now in place. Um, so you can see just, even if you don't completely understand the, the different components, we did a lot of stuff. We put a lot of stuff in place for tier one and tier two. That's kindergarten and this is second through third grade. And those are just best, best practices that we had then put in place compared to where we had rated those best practices um, before we began. Yeah. And we use that also to say, okay, now what do we want to work on? Which I'll tell you about in just a second. So um, we saw some nice growth. This is from middle of the year to end of the year kindergarten. Um, first grade, we saw some nice growth across the year, just in terms of the percentage of kids. And remember, this was just the first year of implementation. And all we had touched at this point was really the decoding and the coordination of tier one and tier two and the screening. Yeah. Yes. And the professional development, I would say too. Um, and, and the other thing I think Holy Family was just so wonderful at is these data meetings, as I've already said. We saw, even though we saw some kids, I think this is actually a third grader, um, we saw some kids who didn't make benchmark we saw amazing growth on their individual progress monitoring graphs, um, which was just really, as, as Michelle said, re reassuring and, and saying, okay, we may not have gotten them all the way to benchmark, but boy, we, we made some nice growth and that's important. We have to keep problem solving and keep working, but um, that was very reassuring. Um, if you use Acadians, you may be familiar with this, um, the Pathways to Progress report. This is our second grade class, and you can see this class, 80% um, of these students made well above or above typical rates of progress. So they were making some great progress. Um, the two students who didn't make great progress um, were actually both students who we did end up deciding they had learning disabilities, they did make good progress. The progress did not show up on their grade level <laughs> pathway to progress, but, um, we saw some really amazing growth across our students, even in that first year of full implementation. Um, and then third grade also made some, made some really nice growth. I have more, more graphs to show you at the end of year two. So that was the end of year one and everybody was feeling pretty good about things. Um, and you know, as happens in schools, we had some staffing changes, we had, we had some illnesses that you know took a really wonderful instructional assistant away from us. And so we, ha we had to deal with all of those things that schools always deal with. So I just like to throw that out there because I think that's just our reality. Um, we had a fabulous special education teacher who um, moved out of state <laughs> after we had just done a lot of work and training and coordination with her. But you know th those things happen. Um, but we started in our second year and we really wanted to focus on writing comprehension and vocabulary work. We wanted to turn our attention to tier three. And um, because of the population, we wanted to do, you know, we've been doing some wonderful professional learning around science of reading and MTSS, but we wanted as a faculty to talk more about our English learners and understand their literacy development better. So we did a, a book study focusing on literacy foundations for English learners. So with our LAPG work, you know, we did tier one and tier two for 
word recognition, now we wanted to turn our attention to language comprehension work. And then at the same time, we thought we were ready to talk about tier three for some of our students as well. So, you know, hardworking educators, um, summer's off is a myth, right? <laughs> so over the summer, um, in our and in summer 2022, we really turned our attention to think about language comprehension. And during the spring, we did begin this work and we reviewed a number of different um, reading programs and none of them quite fit the bill. Michelle, I don't know if you wanna say anything about that because um, I, was, I was pushing to choose a core program. <laughs> I know, and we really wanted to find one when we visited. Um, a school that had a program that we thought was pretty good. And, you know, we, we got to see the um, program, you know, in implementation in a school, but um, it was just not um, knowing what we learned through letters and learning what I learned, you know, at the Mount, um, none of them could do it. None of them could build that you know, the language and could build that core. We just we couldn't find one that um, we tried. We really did, we tried. Um, we just, um, we had to come to Dr. Murdoch and say, now what? <laughs> where I, uh, yeah, this, this is where I knew my teachers, uh, I, I thought they might've lost their minds because um, they, they said like, no, none of these are right. And they were a hundred percent right that none of these were right. Um, nothing we were looking at was perfect. They had good components, but not every, not a great component, not all of the great components. And we wanted great for everything. And they knew enough at that, this point um, because they had had all the professional development, they had had the letters um, that they knew enough to know that that wasn't, that wasn't going to be the best option. Um, so. Yeah. Which, which I, I jokingly say that because I was so impressed with their process and just that, and again, reiterate that whole idea of it's not a program, it's that knowledgeable teacher, right? I mean, teachers need good instructional materials, but it's that knowledgeable teacher implementing with all the nuances that is so powerful. And that's what Holy Family so nicely built. Um, because what we were looking for, because these are knowledgeable teachers, they wanted a program that taught content. We knew we wanted to teach our kids important knowledge building things about the world. We knew we needed to teach writing, writing instruction, both basic skills and writing process skills. We wanted to do that. And we knew we wanted to do that in combination with comprehension work. We knew we wanted to explicitly teach vocabulary. Again, remember our population of English learners. We knew we needed to teach um, English vocabulary kind of at a tier one level, but then also academic vocabulary so that they could have access to more academic texts. So those were kind of, when we talk about the components, those were the big things we were looking for. And we also um, knew we needed time. Yeah. Um, meaning that we needed time to teach all of those things and teach science and social studies as well. And so that's where we were really putting our heads together to think, how are we going to give ourselves enough time to do, do all of this? Yeah. So we kind of combined a couple programs and then it was just so wonderful because we hired Larissa Phillips um, to join our Center for Reading Science as the assistant director. Um, and so she really was amazing in writing lesson plans that really combine. So we kind of have three components that we put together. We call it Project Learn, but they're components that are out there. Um, core Knowledge has some wonderful materials and we use the Core Knowledge materials that are also available for free. Um, so people can check that out. We did purchase a writing program called Step Up to Writing. And we really wanted to use rich text sets and have texts that go in um, increasing complexity in terms of around a theme of knowledge. Um, so we use the core knowledge to really think about our science and social studies standards. So over the summer, um, again, Larissa joined us just at the right time. Uh, also give a shout out to Beth Corbo who really helped with our, our thinking on this work. Um, over the summer, we mapped out all of the science and social studies standards across kindergarten through third grade, and we thought, okay, how can we teach these standards in a meaningful way, but also bring in some of the rich literature um, 
concepts. So vocabulary, comprehension work, knowledge building, and then push in writing as well. So that's what we did. So we took um, the core knowledge materials, we kind of pushed in step up to writing. And then we also made sure that we covered all of the science and social. And actually we cover a lot more science and social oh, studies, a lot. a lot more <laughs> than we previously did. Right. Um, so we decided if we did it together, then we were, use, it was going to be a more efficient use of our time. So instead of having to block out, you know, minutes for separate social studies or separate science times, we were able to do it within the, our language arts instruction. Um, and that's when the, you know, the teacher said like, well, can we use different components to build our own, you know, full program? So that's, that's what we did. And then we took Anita Archer's concepts of curriculum and lesson planning of explicit systematic vocabulary and comprehension work. And we created a lesson plan template, which we're happy to share the lesson plan template. Um, and then Larissa, and then eventually another wonderful reading science doctoral student, Allison Sloan, um, has helped create those lesson plans using these using these materials. Um, and we are going to make those available for free as well. We um, we did K1 last year, and this year we've we've been working with um, two three to implement those. It's been which, great work, great work with amazing. it. It's really it's been amazing. If you amazing. If you walk into these classrooms, I'm telling you last year, the kindergartners and first graders just absolutely blew me away with the, the content knowledge they had and the vocabulary um, that they had and their attentiveness and comprehension um, through these texts was truly amazing. Katie, do you want, or Michelle, do you want to talk about um, Missy's observation when she was doing the um, language testing of the, of the little ones at the end of the year? Katie, do you want to share that? I'm not as familiar with that. Amy, I don't know exactly which one you're talking about. Yeah, so, so when sure she does their language, sorry, I, I put you on the spot. So the, the language proficiency assessments that Missy, the ESL teacher, oh, oh, has sorry, to do. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So um, so our ESL teacher, she was doing the OELPA assessments at the end of the year, and she was truly baffled. She was like, they were answering these questions because the OELPA has listening, speaking, um, you know, there's four parts of the OELPA that they have to do. And um, they, she was just like absolutely blown away by their vocabulary and um, their answers they were giving for these different parts of the assessment. She said they were using words that, I mean, she never would have dreamed they were using. And they, they all did, they all came up because of these different themes that, um, that we put together. And that, you know, when Larissa was write, writing the lessons, we did them all in themes. And she said, they truly retained it and they used it. Larissa, did you want to say something? I saw you pop yeah, on. <laughs> I, I had the pleasure of being in the first grade classroom today. And I was, I mean, I wrote this lesson a year ago, but I was blown away by the students. I asked them what the moon was and they started naming all the phases of the moon and what color it was and what shapes it could look like and where it was in the sky. And, and you know, you I are watching. blown away by the engagement and the language that they are using um, with one another and with, with guests, with teachers. Um, they really are, the students are just really soaking it up. Yeah, I was watching that lesson today and I think Larissa's face was, she was just like shocked. She expected them to say, you know, the moon is round, it's in the sky, it's light, like things that she knew. I mean, she knew she wrote the lessons um, that they would say, but still like actually seeing them remembering from the book they read two days ago, what the new moon was, what whole moon was, crescent moon was, those were the answers they were giving to her and simply based on the work they had done two days ago in another text. And really being able to push in all of those comprehension things within these rich themes so that you're both covering your science and social studies, again, in a deeper way than we ever did before and building vocabulary. And again, 82% of these kids are English learners. Um, and that ESL teacher being involved was wonderful as well in support. And the way those lessons were written by Larissa, they're very explicit in how they're um, how they progress. So that also I think is huge. It's yeah. huge. It's not like we're just picking a book and yeah. writing on random things. So um that's that was important. Yeah, I think that rich 
um, text that is carefully scaffolded. So this book comes first because it's easier. And then we're going to go deeper and deeper and deeper. That's, you know, that's the way to build comprehension and discourse and um, vocabulary. So that was a hit. It was, um, it was a, a lot of good work, but we had a lot of great support people. But um, again, we're, we're going to share those. Larissa is already making a beautiful little Google site that we're happy to share. The only program that you would have to purchase if you wanted to look at these is the Step Up to Writing, because we pushed in Step Up to Writing lessons within Project Learn to really teach that explicit writing. And we've actually added some explicitness to the writing routines as well. So, so the end of the 2022-23 school year last year, um, I always say this and then Katie says no, but um, database decision making is like a well-oiled machine at Holy Family. They do not need me, Larissa, to come to those meetings. We still like to because they're so fabulous to go to, but Michelle and Katie and really the whole staff runs those perfectly. We learned from the best. <laughs> we did. Um, hey, Amy, do you mind if I just say something real quick? No, of um, course. So just to clarify, the, the project to learn was really addressing the language comprehension strand of um, that reading rope, if you're familiar with Scarborough's reading rope. The word recognition piece we tackled first with the phonics lesson library, the 95% group, and then the, the project learn was addressing the language comprehension. So that's why those, those two things are working together um, for that. Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, database decision making was so key and so important. As and as Katie said, continues every every month they meet. They talk about every child who's below benchmark, and sometimes there's quick little tweaks we can make. Sometimes we need to begin speaking about tier three um, differentiation and connected tier two was happening. K K three very very nicely. Um, writing instruction. I, I didn't say this, but. Day one, we began in 22, 23, doing Project Learn. In two, three, they began with the writing instruction, but we didn't yet have the chance to make all the lessons. And so they began doing writing instruction. They um, implemented Step Up to Writing, and they were doing some, some work making connections, but really Project Learn started in earnest in second and third grade this year. Um, and then we began doing tier three training, talking about a tier three process and training all the teachers on what tier three looks like and what we mean by tier three, um, looking at how do we intensify interventions for kids who are still not making progress despite really wonderful tier one and tier two. So I thought I'd put up the schedule now that I've talked about Project Learn just so you can see the pieces. So again, Project Learn is that language comprehension and content knowledge and writing. Um, and you can kind of see how the, the chunks of time are, are spaced out across the day. All right, so now we've got all the pieces in place for tier one and tier two. Beginning of this year, we said we do have some kids in second and third grade who are a little bit of a puzzle to us. Despite really fabulous differentiated tier one and differentiated tier two, they're not making the growth we would like to see. Um, and I say Davis because I, I love this slide by Kareem Weaver. This was actually, I think, a Twitter post. Um, if we had started by talking about intervention and intensifying for significant, you know, significantly behind kids in third grade, we would have been problem solving on 75% of our kids. There's no way we can do that, right? And there was no need. So at the beginning of third grade this year, we were looking at the fall benchmark for third grade. And we had a couple kids in mind that we knew we wanted to problem solve because they had fabulous tier one and tier two instruction. Um, they didn't have attendance problems or behavior problems or any of the things that might get in the way. And they still weren't where they needed to be. Um, we knew they needed to be problem solved. We had two kids like that. That's doable, right? Now those are kids we can go deeper and understand. Um, so that's really what we talk about when we talk about tier three. So tier three in our MTSS model is done in addition to core instruction and tier two. So it's part of the general education. We're not talking about special education, but these are kids that we need to intensify their instruction. So as I said, we trained the staff on what we mean by tier three, and we did lots of work with that. We looked at our data to see which kids we want to do tier three. 
And um, we did have some kids that we wanted to do tier three on. These are just some example graphs of growth, but not quite the growth we want. And so our tier three kind of key components of it, we're starting with second and third grade because kindergarten and first grade, they need a little time to get tier one and tier two going, obviously kindergartners especially. Um, but in both second and third grade, we have kids that we've worked with all last year that we knew we needed to um, focus in on. And we started actually with third grade. And then in a couple of weeks, we're going to start with a couple second graders that we're worried about. And we're doing a collaborative problem solving process where we build a team around a student and we carefully look at their needs. And we're actually really doing a lot of work to think about how do we intensify their needs. And one of our doctoral students and actually faculty members at Mount St. Joe, Jamie Peebler, um, is doing her dissertation on this. And so we brought in Jamie um, and Jamie and I spent the summer really thinking about how to create a structured problem solving form to help teams really intensely look at individual data patterns and understand based on the skill deficits they have and where those skill deficits are. Um, is, it, is it something that the child doesn't have at all or is it something they have but they're not fluent yet with? Um, and really understand both their acquisition level as well as what kind of practice is needed for that. So we've created um, some instructional kind of procedures to both look at data and analyze it, and then some intervention routines that are focused in on the specific skills that kids need. And we're gonna be doing this with kids, creating plans for them based on this. And we actually had our first meeting today, which was really fun, and created a plan for a third grader who needs some targeted support. So she's gonna keep getting her tier one and tier two, and then she's gonna get many lessons on skills that she's, um, not you know not solid with to help her you know make progress so that's where we are right now is really focusing in on tier three and then how to understand those kids who are a little bit more of a challenge for us um so i showed you the kindergarten data already so this was the end of the year kindergarten last year um here's the end of the year third grade and i think and again you know we do have a couple kids and you know we wanted to or we need to problem solve with um they're now in fourth grade but you know, we, we, we don't give up on anybody. We, we are definitely problem solving with these. But look at that. Look at the number of kids that made it to benchmark. You know, that's pretty remarkable, especially considering the, the growth across the three years of implementation. And as Michelle said, it was a team effort. You know, it's, it, it is a great third grade teacher, but this was the same third grade teacher all three years. And she was great every year in terms of her as a person. But now she has the skills and the tools she needs to really move kids to where they need to, and the team she needs to move. In the kids. system. Yeah, in the system. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Katie. Yep, the whole system that helps all those kids move. Um, so I'll, I'll let Katie and, and Michelle kind of chime in on kind of really what does it take to create this system? I know Katie was telling me, um, that, you know, she often gets the question, what reading program are you using? What reading program? Tell me the reading program. Um, but it's really not the reading program. I mean, reading programs are important and they help us, but it really is that system of support. And Having why right MTSS? Team. Yeah, go ahead, Katie. Yeah, no, I was just agreeing with you. The system of support and then giving your teachers that are knowledgeable. So or helping your teachers become knowledgeable. Um, in the, the brain science behind what truly, how do we learn to read and how, what does um, good reading instruction look like that truly is backed by that research. And then after having those teachers, you know, learn all that information, making sure that they're knowledgeable in those departments, then setting up a system that can allow them to be successful. Um, and that's that coordinated MTSS system. And then, um, providing those supports, this, that coaching that they need, you know, that was important to us, um, making sure that as the teachers were going through this, they had some support. Um, and I'd love for Michelle to, to speak a little bit to this. Michelle, you were boots on the ground um, from the get-go, general classroom teacher, second grade teacher, 
um, you kind of, you know, you, you've seen it from start to where we are now, and, and I'm not going to say finish because <laughs> and so right. we're not going to, to finish, um, but maybe you could speak a little bit to what that was like from your point of view um, and what most helped you as a teacher. You know, I feel really lucky to be at a school where everyone is in the same boat and we're all rowing the same direction. Everyone's um, is completely bought in. I mean, we knew we needed help. I mean, our kids weren't making the progress that we knew they deserved. They're hard workers, they come to school, their parents care that they're, you know, they're getting this education. Um, you know, I, I really attribute it to the first day when you brought the lap G to Holy Family. It's like, we didn't even know what we didn't know when, you know, when we looked at the paper and, you know, just the guidance from Mount St. Joe to help us to get to this point. And I really have to put kudos out to my principal, Katie, like the time that you put into this schedule and then for you to be a principal and a junior high math teacher, and you know all that you know about the science of reading, like that is no Wait. short undertaking. You have to, to know we have preschool, so Katie has to know everything about, you know, the preschool um, when we have all of our um, evaluations. But that, I mean, it is, it's truly everyone working together. Like I couldn't do it as just a second grade teacher or Katie couldn't do it as just the principal. I mean, it is everyone working together to do it. But I also have to give, um, you know, just props to our students. I mean, we have the best students that I could ever be blessed to teach. I and mean, they are so hardworking and they're little sponges and they wanna learn so much. And their drive also has to be really made known in this whole process. They work hard too. So yes, the teachers are working hard, but you know, it was a village. It was all of us um, working together and just the children doing so well is what's spurring us to keep going. You know, there's not the burnout. We are all just, you know, so excited and it hasn't waned at all in the years that it's worked. Don't, I mean, I'm not going to say you saw the schedule, you saw what it looks like, but you know, it hasn't waned. I mean, we're all just as excited, if not more excited, because now we're reaping the rewards of seeing the kids do well. So I just, I'm lucky to be where I am. It's, it's the best school I could ever hope to be at. And I think early, and Michelle, that's very well said. And I think that early on, um, something that really helped us, and, and it still does to this day, is watching how excited the kids are when they're like, Mrs. Fry, I can read. I mean, they mm -hmm. would come up to me in the hallway and they would they would just be so excited when they realized like, oh my gosh, I can read. Like I can read because of what, you know, what you taught me. And they really are making that connection. Mm -hmm. You know, I know there are people who could say like, gosh, it's, isn't it, isn't it boring how you're teaching, you know, so, so explicitly, so systematically. Um, the kids don't think it's boring because what's boring to them is sitting and pretending like they can read when they can't. But what wasn't was getting the instruction they needed and suddenly being like, oh my gosh, I just read that word I didn't know. Um, mm -hmm. And so that was something that from the, the beginning, we were like, wow, I mean, that's amazing. The confidence that our kids have really built from this um, is truly, it just blows me away every day. Mm -hmm. And I think too, um, the, the, the heart that you heard Michelle talk about was so important. And when we think about a whole staff, um, you know, elevating those positive teachers like Michelle and Katie, and really that's contagious, especially when it's backed up with here's how you do it, right? So mm -hmm. the, the, the teachers were always wonderful, but they were beginning to feel not so great about being teachers anymore until they had the tools that really helped them see, oh, I can and so any of that, looking to external factors to understand why we got data like the green box went away, right? So it's not the families, it's not the kids, because they do, they, they're they dealing with a lot of things. We have families who are hungry and families who have challenges getting to school. And, you know, there was a horrible fire in our community and a lot of our families lost their housing for a little while. 
There are real reasons that we can point to, but pointing back at instruction can make you know all the difference, right? And and utilizing those positive teachers to be like, hey, we can do that. And then, you know, it's contagious when it's backed up with really solid instructional techniques that we can see the results um, mm -hmm. and making sure that we're cultivating relationships among our staff with our, with our, you know, with our families and our children, but also taking care of like each other in terms of teachers mm -hmm. and saying, hey, let me support you in doing this. And as I said, we didn't talk a lot about the coaching, but our coaching was extremely differentiated. <laughs> Um, there were there were teachers who I was in their classroom very frequently, and then there were teachers that, you know, I was in there to, you know, learn things like Michelle's classroom, <laughs> you know, and she was given given the right tools, and and I think that's important too because teachers need different levels of support, and and support's gonna what is gonna is is what is gonna get us to these fabulous outcomes that that we've seen for kids. And I think really the problem solving piece, like uh, throughout the last two and a half years, every time something wasn't working or there was a barrier, a teacher would come to me and say, okay, this isn't working. And we would sit down together and say, okay, let's, let's fix it. How can we rearrange the schedule to make sure that you have time to get this instruction in? Or how can we, you know, fix this issue so that you can truly, you know, get to what you need to get to. Um, so it's just, it just was a ton of problem solving. It's not like right away we had this like magic answer, but we knew the ingredients to the successful recipe. And so we just had to figure out how to put it together. Yeah. And kind of moving into this year, a couple of things that we've already talked about kind of project learn. The other thing was, you know, with this being the last year of the grant and wanting to sustain this, um, elevating Michelle to a new role as literacy specialist where she can coach and she can do the problem solving and kind of continue that, that good work. Um, they're also now implementing MTSS in four through six because, you know, we want to make sure all kids are successful. So, you know, we've, we've grown it up. And then um, Holy Family is part of a Catholic inner city school consortium. And Katie being the amazing leader that she has, has um, helped other schools. And a lot of schools were calling her <laughs> saying what reading program. And she said, it's not a reading program. <laughs> you need MTSS. Um, and so now we're working with a number of other um, schools in the Catholic inner city school system to help replicate this. And as I said, we're also spreading this across Ohio to help other schools implement um, the science of reading within MTSS, because you can't do the science of reading without talking about implementation and instruction and making all the pieces go together. And that's what MTSS does. So. I know we're just about at time, but Larissa, were there any good questions that we would be wise to answer as part of this? Yeah, so um, we did have a question um, about what assessment system you used. So just to clarify for anybody else who had that same question, they are using Acadians for screening and progress monitoring. So that helps them make those data-based decisions. Um, some people asked about the lap G. It is available. Actually, Larissa, can I add one thing about assessment? Because I think Absolutely, Acadians has been so important, but almost equally important is our um, intervention-based assessments. So our um, the, the tool that is part of the phonics lesson library that really helps us know specific skills and where to place kids into the small group differentiated instruction. We also use a spelling inventory that is very helpful for us. Um, as part of Acadians, we use their survey level assessment to understand if somebody's not at grade level, how do we understand where to progress monitor? So I do think there's mm -hmm. there's an assessment system that has also been very useful to us at the Holy Family. Some folks asked about access to the LAPG, and that is on not Mount St. Joe's website, but our center website, which is readingscience.org in the K-12 section. You can download that, that tool there for free. And it, it um, has a facilitator's guide along with it. So um, it's something that a person who is knowledgeable around the science of reading and MTSS can help um, with that process in their own school setting. And we just added that we're still working on refining, but we just added a series of videos um, that Carolyn Turner and Dr. Wendy Strickler um, have recorded around how to use the lap G. So some professional development that goes along with that, that we just added to our, our center website, if you're interested. Um, someone asked about um, 
You mentioned maybe some technology you used in kindergarten. They wanted to know um, a little bit more specific information about that. So initially they used um, the online component of Super Kids when we were when we were using Super Kids still the first year. Um, and because they had some word work that they could do there, um, they are really not using um, it much anymore now that we've sort of figured out, um, you know, the system and what they can do independently and how we can get them there. We're getting them to be able to do independent work a little bit um, more quickly where we, we've now, for the most part, they're really not using the computer and we're doing um, a lot of um, very specific, you know, centers that are focused on things that usually they just have one, one center that they're um, at independently during their time. Sorry, my dog just found her sweet toy, but um, uh, someone wanted to know if you were able to flood all the grade levels the way um, you were with that grade one sample schedule. So we kind of problem solved it individually based on grade, based on what they needed. But I mean, we did flood all grade levels in the, in the way that we coordinated that tier two support. So all grade levels had a time. Um, that they were able to work on that decoding piece. And we had the general ed teacher, the reading specialist and the title one teacher all working at that same time. So that was, you know, three adults um, in the room at that time. And then for kindergarten, we knew we needed to put more people in so that they weren't spending time independently and we wanted to be able to teach small groups. So we did not only the decoding work in small groups, but um, a lot of other pieces with that. And so we did put people in there. And then we had a time that we had first graders and we had a lot of first graders that needed to be double scooped. Um, and it required a lot of extra time for that teacher. And we didn't want kids to be independent all that time. So we pulled in the ESL teacher there and a couple other people um, just, you know, that were able to provide an extra hand. And then in second and third grade, we really utilized our ELL teacher as well um, there so that when the teacher was working with a small group doing a double scoop, they were still getting instruction from her at that time. So the answer is yes, we did to all grade levels, but but we really did differentiate the needs based on the needs of the kids and the needs of the teacher. And I think it's getting less as they get older. <clears throat> it's getting, you know, we don't need as many of the small groups, second grade a little less, third grade even less. Um, you know, so I think it's, we're reaping the rewards of putting all the time in preschool, kindergarten, first grade, because it, it's getting less and less as they're moving up. For sure, when we looked at third grade this year, we were like, wow, we only have four grades that need to be double scooped. We've never been here before. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is, we're really starting to see that. That the power of that strong core um, mm -hmm. in tier one, your yeah. system is not as overwhelmed now. It can right. truly mm -hmm. um, not just yeah. trying to stop the bleed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and early intervention, right? Like yeah. we will right. always just with the population we have, even though they have preschool, half of them don't go to Holy Family preschool. <laughs> so we will mm -hmm. always in preschool have a number of kids we need to take care of, but take care mm -hmm. of them in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. You you will benefit all the way right. all the way through school. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's the real power of having a principal who gets it and knows reading is the mm -hmm. most important thing in elementary school. Like if we can deliver kids to the next grade level as strong readers, everything else will go better for them, right? We just mm -hmm. know that it's so important. So that's mm -hmm. why, you know, Katie, even <laughs> as, as Michelle Remember, said, I was a math teacher. <laughs> The um, junior high math teacher gets that, and we do still teach math. Math is really important. Don't get me wrong. But if they can't read, they can't. They can't right. teach that math she either. So. For more math minutes um, <laughs> okay. here. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is important, but you know, and again, doing it in a way that takes care of the whole child mm -hmm. is really important because our kids love reading. That's the thing. Um, like we love when people come to Holy Family because. Like we had a bunch of guests there today and I got to be there for a problem solving meeting, but Michelle was telling me how the kids, you know, were just talking about how much they love reading. And it was so great because the guests got to hear that um, and know that, you know, it's structured literacy is fun. It makes it you is. love reading because <laughs> you can do it, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, actually, speaking of that um, tier three problem solving form, somebody asked if that was ready to share or if that's still something in the process. So that's still something in the process, but Jamie and I are going to do a webinar through the Center for Reading Science um, probably in the early winter, and we're going to share that process because we really do want to share it, but we want to make sure it's refined. We have some great people including Larissa, <laughs> helping to um, implement these intervention plans that we have put into place. And we want to make sure, we want to make sure it's nice and refined before we share it widely. Yeah. We can share the lesson plan template though. So if you register for the webinar, you're going to get the recording and we can share some of those things that are ready. Um, I know some people have asked and Amy mentioned um, Project Learn will be shared out um, once that's ready. That's something still in the process. Um, just refining some of those things before they're shared more broadly is something that um, we are certainly making a priority and hope to to share soon. Yeah, and we'll do a, a Larissa and others may do a um, a longer webinar just on Project Learn to get into the specifics because I know we did it really quickly, but um, really neat work and nuances there that others may either like to use as is or kind of take that model and do your own adaptation of it. So, and I, I encourage you to look at um, Core Knowledge. They have some wonderful materials mm -hmm. that are free, so. Yeah. Um, I know you touched on this a little bit, um, Michelle and Katie, but someone asked what spelling assessment you use. Did you wanna um, clarify that just a little bit? So why don't you talk about that process a little bit? Yeah, so in our um, differentiated small groups, we work on a set skill for five for five lessons. And so at the end of the lesson, we dictate six words that follow the pattern of the words that we've been working on in that lesson. And we also dictate two sentences that review past skills as well as skills within the lesson. And we get a like a writing sample. So it's <clears throat> it's basically six words that they spell two sentences that they write. And then we also have them read words, you know, read some words that, um, that practice not only the skill of that lesson, but we try to loop back and have them practice reading and writing words um, from, from previous lessons. So they're not given a, a list to memorize. They just they don't get the apply. word ahead of time at all. <clears throat> no, they just apply their learning in a, just a snapshot it takes about 10 minutes for them to do. Yeah, and then you track those errors for students so that <clears throat> and it's not for the purpose of a grade or sending something home, it's for the, the purpose of informing your instruction. Right, I keep a spreadsheet and I determine if the errors are skill errors, you know, errors on skills they've been taught. Are they like a sight word error, like a heart word, those kinds of things, because those are different errors and we wanna be, you know, track specifically the kind of errors that they're making. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of, um, in some of the schools I've been working with, a lot of great conversations about spelling assessments and how we can really shift our mindset from those former maybe spelling assessments that we grew up with. Um, but, to, you know, the purpose of any good assessment is to inform our instruction and you mm -hmm. truly have that model in place with your spelling assessments. Mm -hmm. And making sure that the words are chosen, the words that are chosen um, you know, are, are focused on that skill that they're learning and or previous skills that are incorporated. We're not asking them to spell something correctly that has a, a skill in it that we haven't taught. You might have you, many students in the same group score, maybe 60% on an assessment, but it doesn't mean they all need the same thing. Right. So I mean, each group gets a different, different. yeah, e right, Michelle, each, each group, um, mm -hmm you know, they're working on a different skill. Each yep. group is, is differentiated. So their spelling is also differentiated. Mm -hmm. they, they're not all taking that, the whole class isn't taking a spelling assessment at the same time they take it in their small group. Exactly. Mm -hmm. oh, great, thank you. Um, someone asked where they could find the vocabulary framework for K-1. So you'll see, um, in the lesson plan template, there's a place for chosen or target vocabulary based on the text. And then there's an instructional routine after the reading of the story that teachers can follow with that vocabulary. So that's really built into that lesson plan. And we share that lesson plan template, you'll see that. Um, 
And I'll say too about the lesson plan template, we worked really hard. So that was where Beth Corbo was brought in and I worked on it. And then Larissa joined us and Michelle and the other teachers. So we worked really hard on the template. And then once we all felt really good about, hey, this is what we want our lessons to look like, then we wrote a bunch of lessons just to, you know, it, it was created by us, but it was very intentional. Mm -hmm. Um, somebody asked if you have high mobility with your students. We typically don't. Um, a lot of our students, once they're with us, they, they stay, but we do have new students come in um, that, you know, weren't with us in kindergarten. It's just that a lot of times kids that are here stay, but we do have new kids come in, um, but, but the majority of our kids do stay um, through most of their career. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about your class sizes as well, just to give people an idea of what you're yeah. working with. So um, we cap our class sizes at 25. Most of them are, especially in K through three, are, you know, 25. I think our, our lowest class is maybe 22 in K through three. Um, yeah. And only kindergarten has an instructional assistant, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Kindergarten and then preschool. Our, our right. preschool, preschool class is at 18. Yeah. Yeah. Um, kids each and they have an assistant and then um, kindergarten has an assistant as well. I think to make sure we got everything answered. Great. And while you're looking through that, I'll just remind everybody that if you are a member of the center, we're going to continue this conversation about implementing MTSS. We'll talk a little bit more about the lap G and I think Katie actually given Michelle the date, but <laughs> I know Katie's going to join us. And um, Larissa and I will talk more about kind of implementation of, of MTSS. Um, I will say that I have had the pleasure throughout my 20 years of education in helping many schools implement MTSS with all sorts of different configurations in terms of class sizes or resources and all sorts of things. And as Katie said at the beginning, it's not a one size fits all. It's about problem solving with your resources, your students, your data, and understanding what's going to work best for your school. Um, so that's kind of how we'll continue the conversation is talking about not, you know, this, I think it's nice to have examples and to see one school's way of putting things together and their process of putting it together. But there's lots of ways that MTSS can work. And again, I've had the, the great privilege in my career to see lots of different MTSS examples um, with different, you know, different configurations of schools and resources and all, all of those good things. So. And, and I just want to say, you know, if there are any other administrators on this call, I think that um, doing something like this and, and this process really can empower your teachers if you allow it to. Um, I think the, the approach is important. But, um, you know, I found that when we did this together, um, it really not only, it, it, you know, it was something that really warmed my heart when doing this, but I saw it empower the teachers to them to think, wow, I'm doing this. I can, I can do this. Um, and so I think in, in a day and age where teaching is a hard profession to be in, this is something that has although been a ton of work on our teachers. And so I don't want to diminish that because they have done a ton of work, but I also think it's been something that has really renewed the spirit of, of our teachers. Yeah, it's been incredible. I just wish I knew this sooner. I said, I, you know, I'm moving forward. I'm so happy that I, you know, I can apply what, what I've learned, but gosh, I wish I would have known it earlier. Yeah. When we know better, we do better. Yeah. We're, we're doing better. We yeah. are doing better. Well, I think that's a perfect way to end. Thank you, Katie and Michelle and Larissa for being on this call and sharing your your insight with us and your story with us after a very long day. So we appreciate we appreciate you and your work and your your willingness to share. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I the sentiment because you were instrumental in helping us. So. Thank you. Yeah, we wouldn't be where we are. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. So. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all for joining us, um, staying late on a school night. So thanks so much. And we, we did record it. So if anybody came in late or um, only caught part of it, we will post the recording on our website. So until next time, see you all. Thank you. All right.